very relaxed. So, right, we are now live streaming on YouTube. So welcome to anyone joining us from YouTube as well. Um, if you're joining from YouTube, be aware that there is somebody manning the chat on YouTube and we'll pass your questions over to us. So please do feel free to post questions on the YouTube chat as well. So this seminar is like all our seminars focused on the, the tea or in this case, mulled wine um, and the tea, the, semi, the chat. And um, so it started as an idea of having a chat over a cup of tea and has evolved into some really nice discussions about teaching and economics in a pandemic, but quite a lot of just general discussions about things we care about in any year. And this year, I'm delighted to welcome Margaret Layton from St. Andrews, um, Prama Choudhury from UCL, and Demetra Petropoulou from LSE, and Anakin Johnson from Bristol, who have all bravely embraced undertaking a first year project online. Um, I think Margaret's the only one who was the first time doing the first year challenge for at all. Everyone else had done it before, so it had to adapt. Um, so I'm not going to say much more. I'll let them in introduce what they're doing. So I'm going to start with Parama and just ask you from a UCL perspective, what is the first year challenge? Yeah, um, thanks, Claudia. So the first year challenge, we started here at UCL uh, in 2015. So yeah, I didn't realize that we were on our completed five years, on our sixth year. Um, and the idea was um, to do three things. So first of all, to um, bring our students together. So we have big cohort, plus we're in the middle, um, like our friends at the LSE, also of a bustling city. So building community doesn't always happen very easily. And obviously we have students from around the world. Um, so first of all, to build that community um, from the very beginning of uh, the students' university experience. Secondly, to introduce them to London, which would be their home, their learning environment, um, and to UCL, so the area around Bloomsbury where UCL is. Um, and then thirdly, to introduce them to economics, because as we all know, understanding what economics is, is kind of a whole mystery to, to school students. So it's not just algebra, it's not just banking, you know, it's all of these different things. So the idea was, uh, this is a multimedia group project. So the group bit is important because that's how you build the community. It's a multimedia project. So it's not just you write an essay or something like that, but it is quite important that you use a different format from what you're quite used to. Uh, to learn this new thing. So everything's new. It's a good thing. Take on that challenge, but also build a community at the same time. So started this in 2015 with Christian Spielman, who's at Bristol uh, now. And um, yeah, so now I think we have uh, we have a schools version of this. It's called the Schools Challenge, not very innovatively. Um, we have uh, international versions of this. We have, of course, lots of versions across the UK as well. Thank you. Um, Demetra, how would you describe it at LSE? Great. So this, we're now in our third year of the first year challenge. Um, just like at LSC, for us, it was definitely a community builder, but it's sort of got three objectives. I think one is to bring our students together. It's not linked to a course. It's linked to students that are, are on economics degrees which in economics, uh, LSC is only a subset of students taking our course. So this was an activity that would be done by economic students only. So the objective, the, the, the ultimate objective is to produce a three minute video uh, inspired by a particular theme. And the theme is presented very much like a treasure hunt. Students have clues and they go around London. Um, so there's a dimension that links to the city of London. There's a dimension that links to a theme in economics. But the, another element is linking to LSE heritage. So somehow the theme will link to something in um, LSE's past, uh, maybe ideas that sprung from LSE in the past and how they relate to something in the present. So for example, our very first theme was the financial crisis, but it was about Keynes versus Hayek, inspired by Hayek being there. So it was about, um, last year it was about uh, the minority report and, um, Sort of the, the role of the welfare state and what was LSE's contribution to the development of the welfare state. So there's got to be economics, LSE heritage and London. So those are the themes that we have as well. Thank you. 
And how about in St. Andrews, Margaret, what's your perspective on what it is? So for us, it is tied to the first year economics module um, in this, this year, the fall, that's microeconomics, but uh, there's no necessity that the students work on a video related to microeconomics in part because they don't necessarily know what that means yet. Um, for us, it's a credit bearing assignment. So it's the, the, the assignment is worth 25% of credits for this first semester module. It starts in the first week. Students are put into groups in their tutorials in the first week, at least, um, well, we did that this year. Normally we didn't have tutorials in the first week. So that's, um, that was a bit of a challenge, but we did that this year and they had five weeks to work on it and submitted it at the end of their fifth week. Um, I think the, the main component of group work, I think was really one of the key things for us as well, as well as you know, a, a diversifying assignments. Although um, we're not in London, so you know, most people that people meet in St. Andrews are associated with the university one way or another. We did find that students in economics made friends outside of economics in their first and second year. And when they formally entered economics in their third year, they didn't really know other people in economics. So we're trying to fight that by creating community um, right from the outset with the first year students. Right, and um, Annika, how about in Bristol? Any different perspectives from them? Yeah, so very similar themes really, uh, all designed to build community. We, we normally start it in a welcome week, the sort of week zero before teaching starts. It's taken by all our economics students, so anyone with that in the title. Um, this year we actually went a bit different. I mean, we do have Bristol here as the city to do it the way uh, actually Christian used to do it over in London as well. This year with the Black Lives Matter protests and the, the fall of the Colston statue in Bristol becoming world famous, that became the focal point for the report, so for the video. So it, it was, um, everybody had the theme of um, racism and equality in Bristol and uh, economics and trying to use those three things to say something sensible, interesting and make a, a, a thoughtful video on the matter. Great, thank you. Um, so before um, we started, some of the attendees had sent in some questions in advance and one of them was sort of, what's the long-term value for community building and doing the first year challenge? But I guess that's part of a broader question of why you run the first year challenge at all. Demetra, do you wanna start with that one? Sure. Um... So we run it, as I said, largely as a community builder because there was a sort of gap in our ability to bring our own students together independently of the sort of very large number of students on their first year course. So just to give you a feel, we have this year around 900. Antonio teaches that he's with us today. Is it 900 on that course this year? Yeah, and our intake is around 230 and they wouldn't be uh, in the same class groups together. So one of the ongoing complaints was that we never have any courses or classes where it's just us. So it was to give them an opportunity to um, get together and, and do that. So that was the main motivation um, and get them to start. And because also at LSC, the introduction to their studies is highly linked to mathematics and statistics and can be a little dry. It's about getting them to think about economics and its current applications as well. So sort of trying to get them to be thinkers, you know, a little bit if possible, you know? Yeah. Oh, and one more thing I should mention, we link it to their academic mentor, which is like the personal tutor. So the groups, so it's an opportunity to create a talking point on which to relate to your, um, to the person who supervises you over the course of your degree, rather than just, you know, what courses are you taking? So that was a key element of it. Excellent, thank you. Margaret, any other rationale at St. Andrews? And in particular, I guess you haven't seen the longer term value yet, but were you thinking about longer term value? Um, so I think quite similar to Demetra, we have a very mixed first year batch. Um, ours is smaller because St. Andrews is smaller, but we had almost 500 students this year, which is very large for St. Andrews. But I think it, unlike um, probably the schools in, in England, our students haven't committed to their major yet in first year and second year. So there's an element of this, which I also felt was a bit of a recruitment pitch for economics, reminding students that economics is a social science, which you don't always get um, from first year. Um, you know, I think the core already does a better job of that than some other textbooks, but making it exciting, making it something they can relate to and something they can explore and run with was quite important to me to remind them that, in part to recruit also those students who ask those questions and are concerned about those issues and have that open mind. Um, I can't speak to the long-term, but I think in the short-term, the 
the, there's other elements to the community building which were very valuable this year in particular in um, welcoming first year students and giving them other points of contact at the university other than me, their lecturer. And I think that's something I hadn't anticipated, but I would definitely promote <laughs> to other people who are doing this project is the fact that they had a group from the first week of term meant they had people to talk to, to ask their questions. Where do we go for tutorials? What, where are the lectures, all this? I noticed a big drop in the amount of email I was getting out of those types of questions once those groups were formed, which I think it will have a long-term impact as well because they'll, <laughs> they'll probably keep some of those friends. But in terms of uh, side benefits of having these groups, um, that's one I would like to flag up. Great, thank you. Annika, any other reasons for running a first year challenge project? Oh, um, <laughs> Uh, you, you covered a lot of them already. Um, I, I, I think, <coughs> I think, for me, it's just trying. It, it's about trying to get them to just sort of think about economics in a wider sense and a non-financial sense from the very beginning. Um, what, what's also good and something I haven't heard before this year was that because all the students, so last year's students who took it, obviously were all applying for internships this time this year. And quite a few of them have come back to me and said, I'm really glad I did that. I, I thought I could think more about how I could present myself on camera and on video. And I've kind of got all the rubbish out of the way. I did the bad bit on my project last year. I understood a bit better. So I hadn't thought about the career implications of it, but the, a few of them have come back and said that independently anyway, which I think is interesting. I, know, it's true. I tend to get a lot of second years saying, I've got nothing to say about group work. And I'm like, hello, the first year challenge. It was just like, and then they go, oh, yeah. And I said, I bet you there was difficulties and you would probably have all sorts of resilience things to talk about. Um, Prama, anything else to add about why UCL does the first year challenge? Um, just to um, say that when, when Christian and I were starting out with this, and now I'm thinking, was it 2014 or 2015? I've lost all track of time and, um, you know, space and everything. Um, one of the things that we insisted on is that it is multimedia. So it's not a PowerPoint. It's not an essay. It's not the traditional formats that people, you know, coming from school, you would be used to, because we thought that would push people to think differently. And... We did find really interesting things coming out as a result of that. In terms of long-term thinking, I'm not sure whether, you know, I would like to hope. So I, I know that, that first cohort, I'm in touch with some of them still, and they still actually are in touch with people in their group, which is amazing. So they graduated two, three years ago, something like that. Um, but we do find that in the second year internships, um, sort of overwhelm them and they forget everything that they learned. So I would like to think there's a long-term impact, let's put it that way. Well, I think one thing, I mean, chipping in as something else from UCL is that people have been braver about doing video assessments in their courses because I think we learned that the students are pretty good at working this stuff out themselves from the first year challenge. So that is something that you became a bit more um, open to. So just before we move on to how exactly these um, challenges were organised, does anybody in the audience want to ask a question about the why? Okay, so Tim has a good question. Does it feel a bit tokenistic? So that here's something you do once and then you leave it? Anyone, Prana, you're nodding, do you want to? Yeah, so I have to say that at the beginning, um, when we started this off, there were very few other types of assessment in the program. So it did feel a little bit like that. But like Clodagh was saying, now we have not just other video assessments, but other types of programs, um, assessments as well, where they have to do independent research and so on. So it feels much more joined up because we can say, well, you're starting it sort of light touch in the beginning as a kind of a fun project, but you will eventually have to use these skills later on. But I think without those joined up sort of bits of it, those, those connected bits of it, it can feel like we do this, we're done. And we have a very short time period based on student feedback. So it's two weeks. And then it's done. And then they're, you know, they're given awards and things like that afterwards. Students can feel like, okay, we started all this whole thing and then we're back to doing the algebra. So it, it is a bit of a risk. Annika, do you maybe want to explain how Bristol's made it a bit longer this year to see if that's made a difference? Or not? Yeah, sure. This is a big experiment this year in some ways. Um, so, I mean, we wanted to think more about the, the personal tutoring link and that sort of continued community building with the tutors as well over the course of the year and um 
so yeah be- previously we've always run it as just a three-week challenge starting from the the welcome week at the start of term this year we've turned it into a six-week project where they meet weekly with their tutors um and discuss it and, and work on it and then submit it um which has produced some much much stronger videos i have to say but that in itself is part of a much bigger program of these types of things. They actually do four projects over the course of the year, each with a different output. So one's a video, one's a research post, one's a policy paper, this kind of thing. Um, the idea being to work on all those skills that we don't necessarily have time to do in other units, you know. So it's, it's got personal tutoring elements like, um, you know, speaking to each other and team building, but it's also got all the stuff you, you can get out, like um, how to reference, how to structure, how to upload something how you know all, all the sort of the, the little things um it kind of gives them a chance to do that whilst talking to each other so um yeah we've kind of gone for it full on this year so um Robin, do you want to answer the school's challenge question in the chat maybe uh, so that's a good question i think uh, the plan is to run it but um so the school's challenge used to be funded by uh, the financial times um, which I think is a bit of a sticking point right now, but I think the plan is to is to run it. It'll turn up on the core website. Do that, thank you. Okay, Margaret, we're going to turn a little bit to how you organise it, but I think you can probably link it to Tim's question as well. And I guess in particular because it's assessed at St Andrews, um, maybe if you can explain a little bit how you organise it, but also how you make sure people engage. What happens if they don't engage and they disconnect? Um, and were you face-to-face or online? Maybe being clear on that bit as well. Um, yeah, so we, we had the joy of launching this for the first time, well, in this fall when everything was changing. Um, we'd committed to doing it beforehand and I decided to keep with it in part because of this group building thing seemed especially important this year. The basic structure was that it was a project done in groups of four to five. These groups were formed within their tutorial groups during the first tutorial, but there wasn't any additional tutorial time given to the project. They were welcome to talk to their tutor about it, but it was also made clear that they shouldn't need to. In fact, um, they, they basically could, could run with it on their own. Um, they were expected to meet once a week and they had a little form they had to fill out to document their meetings um, in part, you know, to have, if there is issue, if there are issues that arrive about, arise about attendance or group work that we would have a record for that. Um, like I say, it contributed 25% of their mark and it was, mostly a group mark, although 5% out of 100%, so a very small little token piece was left for a peer assessment. Um, I don't think the students really understood necessarily how that worked, but it meant they could basically get a 5% bonus or lose 5% on the mark. An implication of that is that if you do absolutely nothing, um, at the end of the day, you can still get 95% of the mark of your peers who worked quite hard, um, which I think, you know, spent a lot of time going back and forth on how how hard to make these peer contribution assessment piece. How much of a stick do we need to keep people in line? We went for a fairly light touch approach this year, which I think I would probably stay with, but there's always some issues about students disappearing. We probably didn't do enough to keep everyone on track um, about that. And I kind of only noticed a bit around submission time. Oh, so-and-so has never shown up. Those things I think in future, we'd like to probably try to intervene with about a bit sooner. But otherwise, we were we were 100% online at the start of the year, although with a commitment to be face to face in small group teaching when we could, which was I think from week four. Uh, but students were told they were expected to meet exclusively online for their FYC groups, and the groups were made up of a combination of people who were online and in person. The groups were randomized, and each tutorial was a mix of online and in person. At the start of the semester, we expected students to be joining when they could. Um, partway through the semester, we realized there'd be people leaving as well. And so there was a lot of (laughs) movement of students in and out of St. Andrews. Um, And so this mix of groups and the meeting online only was a way was a way around that. Um, They submitted at the end of week five. So they did have five weeks. Well, they got their groups in the middle of week one. So they had four and a half weeks to work on this. Week six is a reading week for us. So they submitted it right before their mid-semester break. And then after the break, we had a bit of a competition where they voted on in their groups on their best tutorial video and then there was a runoff of all the best tutorial videos across the students and we gave some awards near the end of the term um yeah on top of the assessment we say 
That's on top of the assessment. Obviously. On top of the assessment. So their grades were separate and they received their grades. And then the voting was actually quite independent of that. So the um, staff voted on, there's a staff prize and there was a student prize um, and basically an opportunity for students. There was engagement definitely dropped in that bit. So the number of people who actually were voting, they were supposed to get back into their groups to vote in their tutorials. And not everyone did that, but some people did that. Um, it was a little attempt to get them to keep meeting up a little bit throughout the second half. But there was a... It, you know, <laughs> there's a lot less engagement in that element of it than in the in the first bit. Um, and just briefly, I guess, to, to, to how it ties with other assessments. We have a lot of continuous assessment at St. Andrews um, throughout the degree. And there's a, a constant push towards a diversity of assessments. So I think I, even if it was the only video, I wouldn't worry about it seeming tokenistic because we're trying to have a diversity of assessments throughout. And so there's, you can't have con continuity and diversity all the time. So I, I would see it as part of that. But I do think we'll be moving towards more video assessments in part now that we're all much more familiar with videos and with that type of working. And, and as I think Brahma was saying, now that we see that, I mean, we gave no instruction on how to make a video. It was off you go, figure it out yourself. That's part of the challenge. Now that we've shown that can work at first year, I think there'll be a lot more um, courage amongst others to try the same thing, um, knowing that we don't actually have to teach them how to do this. They, they figure it out. Great. Thank you. Annika, do you want to give some insight on what you did at Bristol? And maybe because you've involved tutors, help Ralph out with tips on how to get the personal tutors to do what they're supposed to be doing? Always happy to help Ralph out. Um, yes, actually, this was something I encountered in, in when, I, when I did it for my first year uh, here. Uh, you, if you've got a really creative challenge that you want the students to undertake, it really helps if you can give some precise backup instructions to your tutors. So if so, the way we used to do it was we, we'd pick a, 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 I don't know, a, a choice of like 25 points across Bristol or something like that. And I'd say, go off and find a connection to economics in the place. Um, and the students were actually a lot more comfortable with that, with that than the, the tutors were. Um, which made them worried, which made it hard for them to engage, which made it hard for them to, I think, feel confident in their very first sessions with the students. Um, so the second year I did it, I really, I mean, this is quite time consuming on my part, but I, I tried to really up the amount of information I gave them. And I gave them each a suggestion as to what the teams could do in case the teams had no ideas. And then the tutors had something there and they seemed much happier with that. Um, and it was much easier to get started with them. Um, and yeah. did you explain to students that they could expect to be having these discussions? So, because sometimes the students can be the thing that makes the conversation happen, if that makes sense. And we were told we could ask you about this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about how Bristol organised it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, any pushback on the topic this year? like from tutors being any more nervous about Black Lives Matter and- That's like true that. actually, no, I should say, yeah, tutors were really nervous. I was quite nervous teaching it. Um, I didn't set the topic up myself this year. Um, and I, I think one thing students struggled with is you're trying to use this as a community building challenge. And then you drop a topic like racism in there is the very first thing you want them to discuss. That's actually a really, really big ask for the students. Um, but what I found it led to in my classes, at least, was really good discussions about what economics is and what economists do and don't say and which angles of the problems we're looking at. Um, and so even though the, the immediate discussions were quite difficult, I, I felt they made more progress as a result. And actually, they bonded a little bit over finding the question so difficult. Um, so that, that did change how it worked. Um, but I think, I think the end outcome was still quite good. Um, well, good it, it, also, it also felt like something we couldn't ignore. You know, if, if, you, if you ask them to connect uh, economics to a point in Bristol, everything links back to, uh, if not Edward Colston, then another famous figure and the slave trade. You, you, it's, it's really, really hard to get away from and to sort of just wash over that and ignore it, that, that doesn't work either. So in a way, like addressing the problem head on helped with that. Yeah. Making the state statement that, you know, economics needs to take these problems seriously. Very good. Thank you. Brahma, do you want to explain maybe a little bit about the practicalities of setting people up on online? I was going to say, I thought you were the boss on that. But this year, I was lucky enough to have Cloda also uh, helping with logistics. And oh, my goodness, what the mess the logistics were. Um, Usually what we do is the each of the 
tutorial groups that we have, which are constant through the first year. So in their economics course, in their maths uh, module, in their stats module, they're in the same tutorial group, um, hopefully to build that community. So we start that community building with the first year challenge within the tutorial groups, uh, which are about 15 to 20 people. We say that uh, students are free to join, to form their own subgroups. Um, this year, obviously, usually that happens in um, on the first day when they're sent to the assigned location for their group, they figure out the subgroups and you know, all of that. This year with it being online, obviously it was that much more uh, difficult. So we set up everything on Teams. So each tutorial group, which is 15 to 20 people had a separate channel on the first year challenge uh, Teams. And then within that channel, again, they could choose um, you know, how, how to actually do the interaction, how to break up into subgroups. Uh, and Cloda and I had some fun nights in this, you know, when we started the FYC, just looking at people actually sorting into subgroups, uh, saying, who's in London? Okay, I'm from Scotland, you know, whatever it is. And then also choosing how they communicate. So some of the people continue to communicate on Teams. Um, and our idea from the very beginning was that we'll give you the space to work in, to communicate, but you can choose if you want to go off it or whatever. And some groups just went off onto WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever. Um, at that point, I think Margaret was saying before, because it's not summative assessment for us, we didn't really keep track of them. So it's possible that, you know, some groups totally crash and burn, we, we don't know. But I think from what I remember, the number of submissions that we got was close to about 90% of the total groups that we had. So not a lot, not a lot of people crash and burn, I think. Um, logistics were difficult just because um, some students didn't realize that we were on Teams or you know, there, there were some sort of communications is issues around that. But I have to say when we're in person, um, you know, that the first time they meet is at their location and half of the groups get lost. So it's not like it doesn't happen. There isn't chaos when we're in person. I think, um, I mean, Cloda did a lot of work setting up the teams, each of the channels. And because we had 800 people this time, you know, setting up each of those channels, we realized, we understood what can be done on teams manually and what uh, automatically and what has to be done manually. So a lot of work, but in the end, I'll just say quickly here, we're just starting to get our feedback. I'm amazed at how many people are saying it was really smooth and I made some friends, which was all we were trying to do. Yeah, I think just to, we did discover that Teams only allows 30 private channels. So we had to create a second team for it because we had so many students, um, which of course we discovered on the Friday before we were launching on the Monday. Um, but other than that, it was quite successful on Teams, I think. Um, Dimitra, anything else practical? And again, you moved from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Uh, yeah, quite a few things. So uh, we no longer linked it to London locations this year because of course many of our students were not in London. So there was a complete severing of the idea of them physically meeting. It became part of welcome week for them to, there was a scheduled slot in the welcome week timetable for them to meet the, um, the people in their, in their group for the first year challenge. And that was chosen to be sort of midday, which should be fine for, well, sort of fine for everyone. And then after that, it was up to them. Um, so we were very mindful of the fact that if we linked it to a to sort of locations in London, they, many of them couldn't visit. It might be a bit, you know, they might feel bad about it somehow. <laughs> so we didn't do that. And in fact, we didn't do anything um, particularly topical like Black Lives Matter. We stayed well away from COVID. What we did is we this year, the theme was um, I didn't know it yet at the time, but it was about um, we gave them in um, the sum of money that it took to be a student at the launch of LSC 125 years ago, asked them to come up with an investment plan. And then based on the money that they reap at the end of their investment plan of 125 years, what would they invest in in the future? So it was very much about investment and the future, very forward looking, but also heritage, as I said. So it was kind of it was a bit weird. Now, the thing we do though, which we did this year is we have little milestones along the way. So when they meet, they have to come up with a team name. They have to do like a screenshot. When they met in London, they had to do like a, a group photo at their location and send it to their uh, academic mentor. Or, so, and then they're little stages. So for example, they had to come up with an investment plan. Then they were asked to find someone in LSE's history that they admire. 
So there were different, so I would say three or four. Antonio, do you remember? Was it four stages? I don't remember now if it was three or four stages. I think it was four, yes. Four. Yeah, four stages to this year's first year challenge spread over several weeks. So there's like a little milestone every week and that way there's less attrition. But because it's not summative assessment, you know, you do, I think you, you lose a few people along the way. And one of the problems this year, I think, came from the fact that it was much harder to coordinate meeting up because of time zone issues. So some of our students asked for an extension. So I think we gave some extensions because they just said, we just can't find times in the day that everyone can meet. So we end up having two or three meetings for the same task. Um, so yeah, it was a little harder, but I guess I'm hoping it will be different next year. <laughs> and in terms of it, so obviously it's not summative, but you do have kind of prizes or voting and stuff as well, don't you? We have prizes for different categories. Um, in last year, we had students in higher years voting on sort of the, their favorite. So we had staff, fav we had many different prize categories and we always had a category which was London Explorer. So if the video had lots of different locations in London, you come up with all sorts of things, you know, just, you know, it varies year to year. This year, um, is the last year it will not be summative. So next year is the launch of our a new curriculum where the economic students will be taught separately to all other students in terms of their core econ. And the first year challenge will be the coursework component of the introductory course. So we're changing it, Let, let's see. Let's see how that goes. And Tim had a question which was, um, do you think without this, what he's called the treasure hunt approach, but I guess the sort of looking around London for things that it felt different to a regular assignment for students or to previous years? Oh yeah, it doesn't feel like an assignment. It feels, and I'm hoping that we can preserve that even though it will be it will be a coursework component. So there's a sense of mystery. We do not actually release information about that. First of all, it changes every year. We have a lot of a run up. We send them emails through the summer saying, you know, there's this thing called the first year challenge and we'll launch, there's some mystery, we send them hints. We devise a poster that sends, um, that isn't very, it's a bit mysterious. So they can't quite tell what it's about. So we build a bit of hype around it. Um, yeah. So we, we make a marketing a department in your ecosystem. Yeah. And thank we have three, we have a, um, three undergraduate tutors, one for each academic year. And I must say it's very la um, labor intensive. I must, they spend most of their September planning it. I don't know how sustainable. So that is, if I, my advice to another university doing is that if you decide to, change the clues every year, change the theme every year. Um, it's really, really labor intensive. Someone has to plan all that. Um, so I think the, the UCL arrangement, which is sort of diverse, but I think you kind of have a set of locations that you do every year. Is that is that right? Yeah, so we have a, a bank of locations. Uh, and this year we broadened it because it didn't have to be around UCL. Uh, and then we sort of sample from that bank, but it is easier because we have the bank and so completely new each year. And I guess yeah. theme wise, we always connected to the first year, um, so the first chapter of the core book, and it's focused on capitalism. So there's, although, you know, people, the students always see something in a location that we never expected them to see. Um, and I think, Prem, you might want to put the link to this CTL YouTube to the first year challenge videos on as well. Um, but Prama also provided a link to the Sway that we use. So because they weren't in London or we couldn't be sure they were in London, we did make it an interactive map. So, you know, you click on Hampton Court Palace or the Tower of London and you kind of get one of those virtual videos where you go into it and stuff. Um, I was slightly worried, as Dimitri mentioned, that that would make somebody sad that they weren't getting to come here. And we had the same issue with, we got, some of last year's students to record a video about how great it was. And one of them said something about, oh, the best thing was it was pouring with rain and I got to meet people under an umbrella. And I was like, no, don't say that, that'll make them all feel they're missing out on something. But I think, you know, we are where we are and being able to see a bit of London, they seem to appreciate. Um, anybody from the audience got any questions on the practicalities? Um, I think anyone may be thinking about doing something similar. No, it may be worth emphasizing that obviously the way this has traveled was obviously Bristol had Christian move from UCL to Bristol and bring ideas. Um, 
we talked to Margaret quite early on in her thinking. Demetra, did you get the idea from somewhere else or was just developing as something that, because obviously your students are very similar to ours and need that international connection? Well, we were aware UCL had a first year uh, challenge and we did need, we felt the need for a community builder and video seemed a good medium, but we did want it to be a, a changing theme. Um, so I think that's what led us to go down the path of well, very, very high upfront fixed costs. So <laughs> that might change. We might, we might end up rotating across themes and we'll see. Another idea is to try and get higher year students involved in setting up the first year challenge for the younger generation. So like now, if you've gone through the first year challenge, why don't you form a committee of, to sort of come up with clues for the new students? So I found that the, it was a fun activity and they have uh, happy memories from it. So I think there would be uh, enough students, will, capable students willing to help out. So I hope we can get some student buy-in. Um, so just to add to that, um, our first year, we had some funds to actually uh, hire an, an older student to select, uh, you know, take pictures of select locations. And then this year, again, we were able to hire two students, older students who had done it previous year to help us set up the sway that I've put in there and so on. And I mean, I, we couldn't have done it without them for sure. So, I mean, it would be great if we could sort of expand that a lot. I mean, a lot of the work still stays with us. Um, but the input of the students was invaluable. Any other questions? Sure. Um, I have a question, if it's all right. Yeah, please do. Oh, sorry. The, the audio went a bit weird after a moment. Um, so one of the things that, that really fascinated me when I was at Warwick over the past few years was the, the potential for, if you like, place building, as it were. So... Warwick, Coventry, where Warwick University is, has its reputation as a fairly crappy, ugly city, um, but a city which is very misunderstood. And I often, often wondered about ways in which I could encourage my students to engage with the city in which they were studying in such a way that actually they, 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 the city reveals itself to the students. And they, they get a much better understanding about the, the, the challenges facing people in the city. And I was wondering, especially for, I guess, I mean, Bristol and London are Bristol and London. But I was wondering whether for St. Andrews, whether or not actually, you know, if Margaret mentioned the idea that the St. Andrews is just a university town or a university city, but it must have another side and does the challenge in St Andrews help students dig a bit deeper into that town in which they're studying? Um, great question Tim and I would say at the current version of the first year challenge that I've done it doesn't at all because I took the very lazy route of not having a theme I mean I took the default theme of uh, capitalism inequality and growth and I just let the students run with that um, I was very intimidated by the challenge of finding meaningful places and making those connections um, all by myself since I'm, I'm, a, I'm a team of one more or less for the first year challenge. But I think, I think it's a really good idea. And I, there must be, even just the history of the University of St. Andrews would provide lots of interesting things to, to explore. Um, I am very aware or very uh, in, you know, conscious of the time effort going into making those connections and was in some ways quite relieved with the easy out that online learning provided like no that's too complicated for this year so we're not going to do it but i think hearing the success others have had with this it doesn't i can see that it, it really adds a lot to the assignment to do that and st andrews st andrews is a great is it's such a cool town to explore you can do everything on foot so it's very accessible students i think would really love that opportunity to get around and learn new things so i, I do think that other it probably had to think a little bit differently about how you set up the place-based questions but there's lots of scope there. It's just a matter of, I think, um, choosing an angle and going with it and possibly yeah, getting some help from some source uh, to learn more about it. Yeah, I think if you can link up with your history. So the other thing we have, Romina's here, that we do economic history walks and things like that that help us understand a bit more about the area around Greensbury as well, so we get more ideas. Um, there's a good question in the chat, and I'm gonna ask, about this because I actually had a second a first year asked me about this today and um, 
so they said, you know, term one's been fine. I'm a bit worried about whether the start of term two is going to start of the year two is going to be like coming to uni for the first time. And will there be a second year challenge to help us settle in? Um, so does any university have a second year challenge or anything to build on or any thinking about that? I can quickly add there that the reason why we don't have a second year challenge is that I teach in the first year and not the second year. <laughs> and it was literally, I mean, like Dimitra was saying, like, you know, Margaret was saying, it's a lot of work convincing someone else to set up, you know, it, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but I completely agree. This goes back to Tim's uh, earlier question about being tokenistic. It would be great if there was a through line um, with something starting off. And I was just reading the feedback that's just come out um, of the uh, FYC and people said, it was really great to start with something focused and fun. And, you know, I feel like every year should have that. Um, it's, yeah, we would love to is the, is the short answer. I suppose that is potentially where getting students involved may help. So if you encourage, if you have an economist society or a student rep or something to encourage them to take on the mantle somehow um, with some support by second year lecturers and third year lecturers. Ramin? Uh, I, I, actually, going back to Tim's point, it is more of a comment. You know, how can you expand this to other cities that don't have a history of Bristol and London? Perhaps one thing that comes to my mind is making it about the location, economics of location. There, you know, every day we pass on our street. But, you know, let's think about that. Maybe there's an economics behind these locations. Maybe there's an economics behind this shop. That's what one thing that comes to my mind, because essentially I do the same thing, economics walk in. I have to think about the universality of this, how, how this can be potentially extended to other places. And one thing that comes to my mind is really about object orient, making economics object oriented. That's a good idea. Can I just quickly address that a little bit? Um, so I put a link um, at the start to uh, the CTL website on uh, the first year challenge, which has Christian and my paper there. And this was one of the big questions that the referees asked, that people asked when we presented the first year challenge in um, conferences. Okay, so London is easy, right? And you know, what do you do elsewhere? There's a lot of examples there about exactly the kind of thing Ramin was talking about. So, you know, we have a, pub, a, a state school is one of the locations. It doesn't have to be that state school, right? Everyone has a school, a sports stadium. So a lot of uh, colleagues from the US asked, you know, standard US university town, it's not much else there, but you have a supermarket, right? You have a sports stadium, probably. You have a post office. These are kind of the, the um, locations we have as well. So there's nothing special about King's Cross post office, though our students always tend to find something more interesting than what we intended. We intended it at a, as a post office. They find some other random thing happening just because it's on the streets of London. But I don't think much of this has to do with the specific London location. I mean, there are some locations like Dickens' house or something like that. The rest of them are just generic institutions. Can yeah, I come in? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, oh, I was, was going to say, we, we did similar things. I mean, I, I, three of the locations on my list last year were actually different public toilets in Bristol. You know, you, you can find something to say about anything. But we, we've also done challenges in the past, sort of like follow up ones almost during reading weeks when lots of people have still been around, but half the cohort's gone back home, where we've encouraged them to go slightly further away from the university, like maybe a couple, sort of one to two hours walk from, from where we would normally teach them and do a lot just sort of speaking to people, talking to people in like food banks or looking at regions of the city they wouldn't nor ordinarily go about in their, their, their ordinary sort of lives and thinking about, you know, big quality, questions like inequality and, and things like that as well. And that's worked just as well and doesn't necessarily have to link to, to, to big historical events. Yeah, and so I good. With St Andrews, I mean, there's lots of interesting Scottish history and Scottish things that obviously maybe they can't go to, but you could have some kind of ritual thing, even if they're on campus, I guess. Annika, I was just going to say, when you mentioned talking to people, um, my university ethics committee just, uh, you know, blanked out my screen momentarily because that was one issue we definitely had. <laughs> Talking to people for research, well, you need ethical approval. You can't go around talking to people. This is not, are you doing teaching or are you doing research? 
uh, I, I don't know, uh, some combination of the both. They're supposed to be doing research. Does that mean we need ethical approval? We this year took the shortcut of saying you're absolutely not allowed to talk to anyone outside of your group. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're not being I, assessed. <laughs> <laughs> I must man. admit, we did send them armed with a piece of paper and there was, if you speak to anyone and it's recorded in any way, it must, you know, you must get them to sign this. So we, we did do it a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. So um, while you're there, Annika, what kind of feedback have you had from the students this year? And is there anything you think you're going to keep, anything you're going to change next year? So the biggest thing that surprised me on entry to the, to the challenge this year was that students were so keen about group work in, in a way I've never seen them be keen before. And I think that must be something to do with them having been out of education for so long and they kind of just wanted to get stuck into it. Um, what came out at the other end was actually, oh, you know what? Group work's really, really difficult. Um, and perhaps that was even more difficult because of COVID and it was like, oh, we, you know, so-and-so's connection keeps dropping um, and all that, that, that kind of thing struck me the most. Um, but on That's the whole, perfect. I think they liked the, I, I don't want to call it an excuse, but they liked the, the big prompt to speak to other people. Like they, they didn't need to pretend they had an interest in a particular hobby or, you know, strike up too much courage. It was like, it was some directed time where they had to speak to people um, and do something. And that was the thing that seemed to help them settle in the most. Great. Um, Rama, anything that you're gonna keep for next year or change in response? I think you said the feedback's just coming in, but anything striking you as what worked well? I think the the setup that we had this year, which was quite resource intensive, but linking to not just personal, the tutorials, the personal tutors uh, for pastoral care, but also to uh, what we call transition centers, who are older students who kind of look after the first years. Um, that's something we would really like to keep, but it is very difficult to, to sort of set up. And some transition mentors are, are more successful at getting, you know, supporting people than others, which, which is always uh, a challenge. Um, I, the one thing that I saw in the, in the uh, feedback, which was interesting, was um, people recognizing, and I haven't seen this before, uh, so maybe this is different for the same reasons that Annika said, people recognizing that, you know, you need a critical mass of people to be enthusiastic and participate. I've seen several comments like that to say, I was just unlucky. I was the only one putting in, you know, there were only a couple of people, not enough people to get it moving. But I know I have friends in other groups where there were enough people, so it worked. I think that's just a life lesson for them versus sort of anything for us to do anything about. But it might be a good idea next year to, you know, when we do the videos of, of people who've gone through it this year, to bring that out and say, that's one of the lessons that you get out of this, which will be helpful later on. Thank you. Dimitri, any feedback from your students? I mean, I've already mentioned the upfront and fixed cost and how you might reduce that. Yes, and one of the things is the timing of things. So this year, so I found that students that were um, overseas incredibly valued very much the opportunity to interact with others. But then what, what some of the students were telling us, well, in the beginning, we thought it was great, but then because of lockdown and stuff or self-isolation in different halls of residence, we created really strong friendship groups in our halls and those new friendship groups supplanted the friendship groups, the, you know, those sort of Zoom friendship groups that were, so in the first couple of weeks, we didn't know anyone, but then we got to know someone and then it got a little bit tedious having to do this. And also because there was such an intensive drive to create study groups in every single course this year. So um, students were put in study groups as the standard practice for all core courses in economics. And I think that was also true in maths and stats. So for every course, they had a separate group to work in. So there's some like some costs to that, right? So um, I think next year, because these students are going to be taught separately, they could have like a fixed grouping. Um, it, yeah, yeah I think that could help um, to think about the coordination cost if you have overlapping groups. So we have done that. We've linked the math, stats, and economics tutorial group. Huh. Their first year challenge comes from that. So they're a subgroup of the same bigger group, and it's the same personal tutor group. Huh. Um, Margaret, anything to add on student feedback? And then Remy, I'll let you ask your question. So I think the, the, I was struck by the 
by the benefits and the cost or the risks associated with the group work at the end um, at the end of the day, I think for most students, so for some students, it was amazing and they'll probably keep really good friends for a very long time. On average for students, I think it was good to have this other community to reach out to right from the outset. But I do feel that um, for those few students who are really motivated but get stuck in a very unmotivated group, it can be quite a negative shock at the start of their university year. And I do wonder about ways of protecting those students a little bit. I think the benefits outweigh the cost on a whole, but I am, I am thinking of, you know, ways of you know, offering really motivated students an out of their group. If it's really not working for them, they can do it on their own and having some inter, you know, a bit of interceding early on to maybe break up really unproductive groups um, just so that it doesn't demoralize those motivated students who get stuck in a group of four or five. It can happen that you're with, you know, three people who really don't care and that I think that could have a really negative long-term impact on that student who does care, right? So thinking a bit about that, on the whole, I think the, the benefits of the group work were, were huge for our students. And um, I'll be curious to see, I worry a bit about my colleagues teaching next semester and next year, the students arrive and say, where's our, we had so much fun in micro, why aren't we doing fun group work in this module? <laughs> we'll see, we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I think on the, um... The student, so I've been toying with the idea of having a secondary market in my groups in my course, actually, so that if there's a point where, you know, there's almost three individuals suffering in three separate groups, well, why can't they work together? Um, there, there obviously comes a point where that doesn't work. It's too late in the term and stuff like that. But yeah, like you say, maybe in the first two weeks, um, some kind of trading that can go on. Um, Ramin, you had a question. Uh, my question is addressed to Annika. That, that was very interesting. You, you said that the, you ask students to also talk to people. To, to me, that's ethnography, what anthropologists do, which is the exact opposite of economics. Economists actually do ethnography while they're doing RCT, but they never know that they're doing ethnography. So that's, that, that, would you be able to talk a little bit more about what you ask students to do? What, what are the out, outcomes that they need to produce? Uh, yeah, so that was more specifically referred to, to a challenge we ran uh, um, on Reading Week last year, where we, we kind of pushed that as a big thing. Um, so I think there it's, it's important to remember that we only had, it was, it was a sign up to event, so we only had the most motivated students in the house to start with. Um, but yeah, we, we, we actually just asked them to take a walk. We asked them to take a walk from where we were, at the, the lecture hall we were in, for a couple of hours and just think about the economics that they see on that route. Um, and if an opportunity presented itself to speak to somebody about what they where they were or what they found or what it was like, um, then they should do that. Um, which was maybe a bit brave and having heard what Margaret said, maybe crazy, I don't know. I'll call, blame it on youthful, youthful optimism at the time. Um, <laughs> And they, they, we kind of let, let them loose on that in the morning. And then we asked them to come back at the end of the day. And they basically had a couple of hours to, to put together their findings and link it with some of the data we've been looking at beforehand and think, well, do these two things tell the same story? Does the data tell the same story as what we've just encountered with people on the street? And if not, how do we reconcile that? And why is that driven the difference? Um, and we had some really great results I mean so some people went back and went you know what it's really hard to get there and despite it being the richest area of Bristol there are absolutely no bus routes and that's really problematic because there's a council estate right in the middle and so you've got this group of people who are trapped and you know that that was interesting and then you had other people who went out to, to areas I don't know a bit, a bit like going back to Deptford or something back in the day in, in London times almost um where there was just a group of people who never interacted with people from the university. These, you know, these were quite two big divided parts of the city. And it turns out they had a really nice couple of hours conversation with the, the guys at the, there was like a cafe that run next to a food bank and they, they spoke to a lot of locals there. Um, and what was interesting was it, it made them think a lot more about the nuance that was missing from the data. And that was probably the punchline of the day was what's what's missing from the numbers that we're seeing and just talking about so casually during the term. Um, excellent. Yeah. What an excellent way to end this seminar. Um, so thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, you can unmute and give them a round of applause, I think, or use Steffi's approach of a virtual one. Um, we shall be back in the new year with um, 
still online. So I'm sure our seminars will stay online so people can join in because nobody has a budget to travel to London for a seminar ever again. Um, I hope you all have a very nice break and a very happy new year in whatever form of tier you're in, in whatever country you were in. Um, I just also add a huge thank you to everyone for um, supporting us, attending these. I mean, I can't believe we've had 12 in whatever, six months or whatever, we've started them. Um, so thank you. During a pandemic. Don't During, forget don't about forget that. About yeah, yeah. <laughs> With a few other things to do on the side. Uh, who knows? And thank you very much to Maddie, as always, for doing everything. She most definitely deserves a holiday. Um, uh, take care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.